Well, I'm sure you don't want to hear any more of this nostalgic stuff, but I tell you, I, uh, I cry every time I come to one of these because I remember the very first one 46 years ago. Had about 12 people in the choir, a piano, and that, a bass, maybe, I'm not even, maybe Scott played the bass, but, and it was good then. For what we had, it was great, and look where the Lord has brought us. I looked on the stage last night when all the children were up here, and it brought tears to my eyes. And it just, it reaffirms something I've felt for a while. We are not a church effective if we are divided. Nothing divided is effective. A house divided itself, a nation divided against itself, a, a congregation divided, and somehow we are going to make that adjustment and it'll have to be made numerically uh, put, uh, with seats, but it'll have to be made up here in our heads too, that Jesus is coming and we are getting this generation ready for the return of Jesus Christ. It may not always be, it's, it will not be comfortable for me. For us who, you know, are used to the kids being somewhere else, it won't be comfortable. But you know, in fact, you can sit down. I'm going to preach now. In fact, I want to go to Second. Stephen, I think I'll go to 2 Chronicles. Get the picture of this now. Israel, Judah is surrounded by enemies. It's bad. They've been threatened once again with annihilation. Here's what they prayed. O oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us. Neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon you. Let, let, let me say this. Nothing has changed. We are the people of God, and we are surrounded. And this world hates us. And Satan's objective is to destroy us. We know all the scriptures about greater is he who is in us, on and on and on. Wow. Let it rain. Wish the Lord would pour fire on us like that in here. For you that prayed so desperately for rain, you forgot to specify Friday. <laughs> well, I'm going to go on with it anyway. We are a hated people because we are the people of the Lord. We are a threatened people because Satan goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Nothing's changed. But our eyes are upon you. And listen to this verse. Now all Judah with their little ones, their wives, and their children stood before the Lord. Wow. This was a bad time. But they did not try to shelter their children from the danger they were in. We've been told by society that our kids are so vulnerable, sensitive. We don't want to scar them. We don't want them to, them to hear any bad news. We don't want to see uh, mama crying or daddy upset about things. And, and so we just kind of push them over to the nanny. And we deal with all the stuff. Israel never did that. Israel said we are a nation and we are a family and when we are threatened, 
That includes grandparents as well as babies. We're all in this together. And the children needed to see dad standing there saying, this is a bad situation. We need God. And the children needed to see mom crying and saying, God has to help us. It was something that formulated a faith in them when they saw their parents in dangerous situations calling on and trusting in the living God. Our eyes are upon you. And then I turned over to Nehemiah chapter 12. Something's different now. That was a dangerous situation. They were a threatened people. But now time has passed and God was faithful and God delivered them and brought them through. And now they're having a dedication ceremony for their walls and rededication for their temple. God was faithful. And so here's what it says. The singers sang loudly. Oh, they've got two choirs going on here. I'm reading it. They appointed two thanksgiving choirs, one on the right hand and one on the left. And then they brought in the trumpets and the instruments of David. <clears throat> so the two thanksgiving choirs stood in the house of God. And the singers sang loudly with Jezrahiah, the director, also that day they offered great sacrifices and rejoiced, for God had made them rejoice with great joy. Listen, the women and the children also rejoiced, so that the joy of Jerusalem was heard afar off. What a passage of Scripture. In that first passage, they're in trouble but they face it together. Mom, dad, grandparents, children, babies. God has brought them through. So now it's time for a Thanksgiving service. And they all thanked him together. Grandpa, dad, mom, grandma, siblings. It was a family affair. Serving God was a family thing. I repeat, they never pushed the kids over to the side so they wouldn't be hurt or frightened. They knew that as a people of God, the children were going to have to learn how to worship, how to pray, how to operate in faith. They're going to have to learn that days come by when you cry and you are afraid and other days pass where you lift up your hands and rejoice. It's all about the life of being an Israelite. And so it is with the church. Whatever we're facing in this world, the church has to face it, not in groups, not segmented and segregated, but together. Little ones need to hear this preacher scream. Children need to see mama crying in church. Young men need to see their daddies involved in the worship of the congregation. That's how they learn the church life. It's how they learn the life of faith. It's very, very important that we understand. We can't protect our children unless we fill them with the Word of God. I've asked the Lord to help me here because I'm going to say some stuff. I wish Christians would wake up. Some of y'all need to wake up. This world is your enemy. And with all these mega churches trying to make services conducive for everybody, regardless of your sexual orientation or your political affiliation, we just want everybody to come because we're all in the family of God. No, we're not. Israel wasn't a part of the world, nor is the church a part of the world. We've been born from above. 
People say, we're all the descendants of Adam. Well, I got news for somebody. Uh, 50-something years ago, all that changed in my life. I knelt in an altar. It was at the foot of the cross. And although I may have come from Adam, I got a new father that night. He's the father of glory, the father of lights, and his son is Jesus. This is now my family. I don't belong to this world. It's not my home, and these are not my people. My people are those who are the blood-bought, spirit-filled, sanctified, sealed men and women, boys and girls of the family of God from heaven. Somebody say amen. Amen. But if we're not careful, we'll fall into that trap. You know, there's a subtle poison movement going on in this nation. They call it woke. Now, I don't know where you sit on that or stand on that, but to me, it is demonic, and it is eating away at the fabric of this nation, but ultimately at the fabric of Christianity. When you want to forget everything that happened in the past, it just means you're going to repeat it again. Stuff that happened, bad stuff that happened, needs to be taught, needs to be remembered. The children need to know why it happened, to whom it happened, who did it. There are lessons there. We shouldn't erase everything. We should be able to learn from everything. But because of that movement that's seeping into the church, we kind of want to pacify people. And somehow when you compromise in that way, you lose your identity. You you forget that you've been called by God, that you're in the church of the living God. Israel makes sure that their children don't forget who they are. They know it. And my drive today at my age, all of a sudden it's exploded inside of me. I want our children to know we don't belong to this world. We don't mix. We don't mingle. We don't water it down. We don't pacify people. We're not afraid of anybody. We stand up for the truth. We yell it out. We cry it out, but we live it out because we are the church of the living God. I tell you, I found this scripture Uh, early this morning. The Lord really, I, I say he messed up my morning. Thank you, Jesus, for talking to me. But I had something already planned to preach in the Lord. I thought it was from him, but I guess it wasn't. Listen to this, same book, Nehemiah. Now, on the 24th day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting and sackcloth and the dust on their heads. And then those of Israelite lineage separated themselves from all foreigners. What can I say? You know, we've gone through this phase where we just want to mix in. We don't want to be offensive. We want anybody living any kind of life to come in and just fit right in and feel comfortable. I don't read that here. They separated themselves from all foreigners all people who did not belong to that family of Israel. They put a distinction between them. You know why? Because when you accept anything and anybody, no matter what, you're the loser. You're the one that finds your faith diluted. And Israel knows that even today. It says, they stood and they confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. Wow. They were repenting for what their fathers did. And they stood up in their place. Listen to this, church. And read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for one-fourth of the day. 
One fourth of the day? They stood up with their children and listened as they read from the law of the Lord. We ain't talking about 10 minutes here. We're talking about a desperate people who know that without God's direction, they are nothing. And we all know how we've been, I guess, coddled and ill-affected by entertaining church services. As long as it keeps us doing this. Woo, wow, woo, hey, woo. Wow, woo, ha, ha, ha. Yeah, I like that. Time to go, though. It's been 30 minutes. If I were to announce everybody that loves God in this building, meet me at 2 o'clock this afternoon in this building, I'm going to read the book of Deuteronomy to you. Ain't nobody changing their schedule yet. You see what I'm saying? And yet they did it. One-fourth of the day they stood and listened to the, the law of the Lord their God. And for another fourth, they confessed and worshiped the Lord together. Now, that's a desperate people. Why would they do that? Why all of a sudden does Ezra and Nehemiah feel this compulsion to call the people together with their families and read the law of God? It's very simple because they had forgotten it. And when life gets good, you forget God. And when life has no stress left and the problems are solved and the prayers are answered, you don't go back to your knees as you did when you were in trouble. Oh, are you listening? to The worst thing God could do for you is to give you what you want. And I'm going to prove it to you with Scripture in just a moment. They just simply forgot. And then I turned over to Psalm 106. Can't read the whole chapter to you. It starts out like this. Now, this is a reminder of how God had delivered Israel. We have sinned with our fathers. We have committed iniquity. <clears throat> we have done wickedly. Our fathers in Egypt did not understand your wonders. They did not remember the multitude of your mercies, but rebelled by the sea. Nevertheless, he saved them for his name's sake, that he might make his mighty power known. He rebuked the Red Sea also, and it dried up. So he led them through the depths as through the wilderness. He saved them from the hand of him who hated them and redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. The waters covered their enemies. There was not one of them left. Then they believed his words and they sang his praise. Did you get it? When they remembered what God did, when they doted on what God did, they sang his praises and they believed his words. Next verse. Then they soon forgot. Uh-oh. Do you want me to proceed with this message? Then they soon forgot his works. They did not wait for his counsel, but lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tested God in the desert, and he gave them their request but he sent leanness unto their soul. Oh, there it is. What is it about us? How soon we forget? Do you remember when your life was upside down? Boy, as I'm standing here right now, I am just recalling a moment in our life. And it hasn't been that long ago that I thought we were going to die. The burden was so heavy and the grief so great. I honestly thought that day I could not live through that day. And we desperately knelt before God. And the prayers came out, came out of me in an unknown language. Agony, grief. 
You know, that was the most fruitful time in our life. We were closer to God, even though we felt farther from God than we had ever been. Because there's something about pain. It is a necessary ingredient in the Christian faith. Pain is the thing that makes you realize you need God. Grinding from God is what makes you usable for God. And yet we are always trying to get out of it. Remember how many times I've preached in this church, Pastor Greg? I'd say, what do you want from God? Deliverance or development? What do you really want from God? You want out of this mess? You want it to be over? Or do you want to know Jesus like you've never known him in all of your life? And nobody's going to jump up and say, I'll take the discipline. I'll take the development because we all trying to grit our teeth and say, that's going to be tough. But God knows unless we are there, nothing is being produced in our lives. Here's what it says. They forgot his works and they didn't wait for his counsel. Ooh, that means they went ahead and made decisions without praying. They went ahead and got married without direction. They borrowed the money. They bought the house. They bought the car. They, you know, they did it all without waiting on God because they had the money and they were in love and it looked good. Uh, why do I need to go and lay before God about this? Because, <clears throat> because God's ways are wise ways. And what we want far too many times does not line up with what God wants for us. Are you listening to me, church? They did not wait on God. You see, when you forget the faithfulness of God, you won't wait on a word from God. Let me tell you what makes Satan tremble. And it's not full churches with loud music and even demonstrative worship. Here's what makes Satan knock his knees together. A broken, hurting, tearful, pain-ridden child of the Most High God. getting down and saying, I got nobody but you. I want nothing but you. <clears throat> My life is a mess, Lord. Thank you for knowing it before I do. I come to you and I wait. I wait. I'm not in a hurry. The reason I'm in this mess now is because I've been in a hurry. I've often told this congregation, one of the facets the Lord taught me about getting messages for a congregation is waiting. Not just studying, but waiting. You know, when you go before God, sometimes I don't go without a, uh, I go without a Bible, without a notepad. I don't go in to get a note. I didn't go in to get a word. I just go in to say, here I am. I'm giving you me. You got all of me. I'm not coming expecting anything. I just want to come say, here I am. I am a living sacrifice. I've got no better thing to do than sit before my God and wait patiently. Because the Bible promises me if I will wait patiently on the Lord, He will bring it to pass. I don't have to make it happen. He will bring it to pass. I'm not talking about, you know, slight prayers or prayers you write down and hold up or the request you put on the, uh, the refrigerator. I'm talking about a broken, emptied vessel of the Lord who says, I have no life without you. I, I won't do anything but make another mistake unless I wait on you. When you get to that place, you forget what, we forget what we've done. 
we have been unfaithful to God, but he's been faithful to us. We forget that it was God that brought us where we are today. We forget that if it hadn't been for God, tragedy would have overtaken us. The devil would have had his way with us. We forget that. We also forget what God has done. He's put a hedge about us, filled us with the Holy Spirit, given us promises unlimited. We forget what God has done. But you don't get that on the run. You don't get strong while you're running. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. You, God's not going to inject you with strength and insight while you're on the go trying to get something done. God waits till you slam on brakes and say, this is, this is foolish, this is futile, and you stay before him. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Even young people will faint, but they that wait on the Lord shall be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Is anybody hearing me today? And that's what the kids need to see. That's what I'm preaching about. I remember when I was in fourth grade and they told my mother she had cancer and that she was going to die unless she had a certain kind of surgery. And I told you last week my dad had to work in Florida for a number of years. And she, it was just mom, me, Dennis, and Janice. And I remember her going in a bedroom one day after she got a report from the doctor. And she began to wail before God. I watched it. I sneaked in there and watched my mother. And I listened to her wail before him. Lord, if, if it's your will, if it's your will, go ahead and do what you need to do. If it's your will, could you heal me? I want to raise my children. I don't want to leave them without a mom. And oh, when I say wail, and it moved me. I saw something in my mother that said there is a faith in a living God somewhere. As a little boy, I used to hear my dad praying and crying. And I'm going to ask the question again. I feel like we've been distracted and I can't get your attention back now, but I'm going to try. I want to ask you dads a question. Do your children ever hear you crying out to God? Moms. Do you ever just push them away because you don't want to see? They don't need to hear you in your agony. Or do you let them participate in your trouble? Because what did I say in the first service? Trouble is transportation to a different level of faith. Your children need to see you move from faith to faith. And the only design God has for that is trouble. Paul said when we went to Macedonia, we had trouble all around us. Outside were fightings, inside were fears. We were an emotional mess. But God who comforts those, that's what trouble does for you. See, when we are weak, we are strong. So I ask you young parents again, do your children ever hear you cry out to God? Do you, dads, dads, listen to me. Do your children know that you have become so desperate that you have fallen before God and will not get up until he blesses you? Folks, in these last days, when this kind of preaching and this kind of praying is kind of over to the side, you know, it's for fanatics, we are missing out on some of the greatest teaching for our children. They need to see us in our agony. They need to be with us when we rejoice and worship God. They need to be with us when we are surrounded by the enemy. 
and hear us cry out to God that God would deliver us from the materialism and the thinking of this present evil world. We're about to leave this place, brothers and sisters. This is not our home. And I'll say it again. The worst thing God could ever do for you is give you everything you ask. Because you can't ask for things that are able to grow you spiritually. In fact, I, I read it right here. He gave them their request, but he sent leanness into their soul. God said, is that what you want? You keep insisting? Is that what you want? You got it. But along with that comes a leanness, a, a hole, an emptiness, a dissatisfaction. You've let that fill the place that only God can fill. It's real dead in here today. I'm almost in a sense of panic right now. No, sir. We're listening. Are you listening? We're listening. Yes, sir. We're taking it in. Because we've come through about 40 years of preachers telling you whatever you say you can have. Whatever you want, God will give because he wants you to have what you want. That is so wrong. I just read it. He let them have what they insisted on, but he sent leanness to their soul. I want a fat soul. All right. yes, I want a soul fat with God's spirit. I don't want a lean, dried up, skeletal soul, anemic, pale, ashen soul. That knows, that, that, that knows there's a God, but there's no power, no, no interaction with God. I want a soul that's full of the Word, full of the Spirit, full of God. I want a soul that's satisfied with Jesus and nothing else. Does that make any sense? Stand with me then. Well, David, I appreciate you hanging around. <laughs> Join me around the altar if you would, please. I will tell you what I told the first group. There are some people here today who don't know how they're going to get out of this mess they're in. It looks impossible. You're here. We call it trapped. Trapped. It may not have been of your own making, but here you are. Let me tell you this about that. When you feel like your back's about to break, I will tell you that God is stronger than your back. God will carry you. If you want to delight God, I'd tell you just to crawl up in a closet somewhere. You know what I mean by that, don't you? A, a holy place, a set-aside place. If you don't do anything but cross your arms like this, I've done it every way you can imagine. I shouldn't tell all these things, but in my study at home, I don't have an office here. I have a study at home, and in the corner, it's just kind of messy. I've got pillows and blankets and a little altar. And I go in there, and I wrap up in those blankets, and I lay in that altar, and I put my head on those pillows. I don't say a word to God many times. I just say, I'm here. Here I am. You sought me and you bought me. I am yours. And it's messy, but I'm not, nobody's going to visit. That's, that's just me and God. But when I come out, I know I've been in the presence of Jesus. I would encourage every one of you to do the same thing. Oh, yeah, I love blankets. I just wrap up in them. I'll turn the back. And I got a big fan in there, too. Turn that fan wide open so I can't hear anything else going on in the house. 
And there it is, just Jesus and me. Those are precious times. Sometimes I hear nothing from God. Other times he just whispers sweet things. But every time, something happens. Every time, something happens. So I guess what I'm trying to get across today, and I'm struggling a little bit. Our children watched us go through these things. Our children watched their mother and their daddy pastor a church and go through all the stuff. They know about the ministry. We didn't try to protect them from everything that's going on. Because this is a family thing, brother. It's a family thing. Get them in on it. It's a family thing. All right, listen to this now. Remember when God told Abraham, take your son, your only son, whom you love. Take him to the mountain that I will show you, and there offer him as a sacrifice to me. I'm a dad. Can you honestly take a moment and try to imagine how Abraham felt? This was a son of promise. He's about 20 years old now. He's been enjoying this boy for decades. And then God says, now I want you to take him and kill him as a sacrifice to me. Oh, oh. And Abraham got up one morning. And he got the camels, the donkeys together, and he got some servants, and he said, uh, Isaac, come on, son. We got somewhere to go. And they took the wood, and they took the fire. And when they got to where they saw the mountain, Abraham looked at his servants, his foreigner servants. He said, you stay here. I've got a family matter to deal with, and it's going to be rough. It's going to be the worst thing I've ever had to deal with in my life. It involves my family. But we're going, and we're going to worship. Don't know what I'm going to face when I get up there, but I'm going to worship when I get there. My son's going to watch me worship the true and living God. No matter what the end result will be, we are going to worship as a family and then we're coming back again. Because Abraham knew if God said this boy was a promise, even if he killed him, God would raise him from the dead. So I would encourage you families, when you don't know what's about to happen, just say, we're in this together, and regardless, we are going to worship and God will bring you back. Here I am to worship. Here I am to try. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely. All together worthy. All together. Now, Father, we have heard your word. We have felt the promptings of the Holy Spirit. I pray now that we will act on them. Cause us to do things we've never done before. Cause us to live drastic lives for your name's sake. Cause us to become fanatics for Christ. Let us not be ashamed because time is running out and you're coming back for a people who are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, nor are we ashamed to worship you in spirit and in truth. I pray for all these families that are going through it, O oh Lord. And I pray that they will understand that this trouble is transporting them to a level of faith they've never had before. Let the words of my mouth 
and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength, my redeemer, amen. Love you, church. See you next time. Drive carefully, please.